We're not too late in getting our priorities right, refocusing our national goals, and realigning our national priorities and strategies. If the king, government, and the people continue to work hand in hand with dedication, perseverance, and fortitude, we still have every opportunity to further strengthen our country and achieve greater prosperity for our people. I am good. That was from His Majesty the King. Kusambala, uh, I'm Sangi. Uh, welcome to the 45th session of Bhutan Dialogues. Our theme today is the changes we need for a UN we want. Bhutan joined UN as the 128th member on 21st of September 1971. Since the membership, Bhutan has been home to UN agencies, funds and programs that work to respond to the national development needs and improve the economic and social conditions of the people of Bhutan. Bhutan's membership to the UN was symbolic to the country's decision to break out of its country centuries of self-imposed isolation and enter the modern world. The UN supported the very foundations of modern Bhutan, for example, through supporting the establishment of the first airline an environmental trust fund to the current day supporting Bhutan's capacity to mitigate the impacts of climate change and recovery from COVID. Bhutan's membership to the UN was vital for the international community's full and formal recognition of Bhutan's sovereign status in the community of nations. This was of utmost importance, especially for a small, landlocked, and economically vulnerable country. It was also the best way for Bhutan uh, to enhance relations with other member states expand economic cooperation, and plan a role in international affairs. Furthermore, pursuing development with values grounded in GNH is the foundation of UN's partnership with Bhutan. UN Bhutan says that it's their privilege to serve Bhutan and further adds that the priorities and agenda placed by Bhutan is also their priority. UN Bhutan have achieved a lot so far and recognizes the space for strengthening its support activities and building on the past. With this in mind, Bhutan looks positively towards future and beyond with strong UN Bhutan partnership. With this, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Gerald Dali. Gerald Dali has been resident coordinator of UN Bhutan since March 2017. Uh, prior to his appointment, uh, he has served at the UN headquarters. He was head of programs for WFP Asia, country director for WFP Bhutan, deputy uh, Country Director for WFP India, Head of Disaster Preparedness for WFP Malawi, Head of Logistics in Eastern Sudan for UNHCR, and Head of Logistics in Western Sudan for Gold Ireland. Throughout this time, he has been most aptly inspired by his partner, Celine, daughter Katie, and son Liam. We have our host, uh, Dr. Carver Pinso. Apart from having served as the President of Bowdoin Foundation, he is also the founder of Shijin Agency of Bhutan's Cultural Documentation and Research, a project that aims to carry out an extensive audiovisual documentation to support local communities to preserve and pass on Bhutan's rich culture and heritage to future generations. As I close, I suggest everyone, uh, these, uh, those joining online and as well as in-person audience to keep their questions short and to the point. For our online viewers, please drop your questions in the chat box. Pema and Ugen will be compiling the questions and at the end of the session, as usual, uh, put forward. For in-person audience, may I request all to maintain silence and keep your phones on silent mode. Uh, please allow me to close with a quote from the UN Secretary uh, uh, General Antonio Guterres. In the end, it comes down to values. As was said so many times today, we want the world our children uh, inherit to be defined by the values enshrined in the UN Charter. Touch the land, thank you, and I pass it on. Thank you, Sangeet. Uh, good example, everyone, and good example, Jerry. Uh, almost uh, seems like a grand finale to me. After four years of working on Bhutan Dialogues with you, finally to have you here as the guest, and uh, particularly after such a wonderful year, um, UN under your leadership here in Bhutan has received a park next door. You have received the Druk Tukse Award. You have done so much uh, to help the people of Bhutan. How do you feel right now with all these achievements and awards? I feel good. Obviously, uh, this is the work of 50 years, so I stand alongside 
uh, those who have gone before me. And um, I would have to say that not only have we been given a recognition, we've been given a, an accountability. Um, the Sedrong UN Park, uh, the Druk Tukse, uh, we have to step up. And every day we, as UN staff, working with our government counterparts, we have to be asking ourselves, are we walking the extra mile for the vulnerable in this country? Every day. And because the Druk Tukse and um, the UN Park are right beside UN House, there is no way we can avoid this reminder. So uh, it has helped to boost the spirit of the people here in the UN House? I think we always had a pretty good spirit here. Mm. We always recognized we were working in a great country. And uh, so we always had a good spirit. Uh, and uh, there is such close alignment between the values of the United Nations, the SDGs, the UN Charter, and gross national happiness, that we were always doing pretty good. But I would have to say the recognitions that we've just spoken about have given us an even bigger boost. And you have spent uh, 32 years in the UN. Um, that's pretty long time. Uh, do you have some wonderful memories and experiences that you want to share or some worse experiences from, the, from which you learned? Yes, 32 years is a chunk of time. Um, I've had some tough experiences mm. and I've had some learning experiences and sometimes I'm not able to differentiate between the two. Um, I, uh, I started off with some tough experiences in a war in the Lebanon mm. in 1982 about three or four years later, I got involved in a, indirectly a civil war in South Sudan. Um, then there was various highlights between South Sudan and uh, Afghanistan about 12 years ago, and North Korea around the same time. Um, these experiences have given me a particular perspective on what it is to be a human. I think Afghanistan is going through a very tough period at the moment. It's not likely to end anytime soon. And some of those challenges may even eventually uh, cascade into places like Europe. Um, similarly, we see that the instability in the Korean Peninsula continues to affect Asia. So these are the challenges of the modern world. And if we are trying to make a difference in the modern world, we have to be mindful that there will be challenges. Um, I'm generally sure that uh, the UN has done wonderful work everywhere, but um, the UN has also sort of grown and has become a kind of a bloated sort of bureaucratic machine. Right? And I think we have had some discussions about this in the past as well. If you look back at your 32 years of service in the UN, and if you're right now placed in the seat of Antonio Guterres or whoever is powerful to change things in the UN, what would be the few things that you would change for the UN to make them more effective? So it, it is true that uh, in, in some parts of the world, people say and consider that the UN is bloated. In fact, there are more people, policemen and women, in New York City than there are staff within the United Nations. So the United Nations in relative terms, has a relatively small number of people, relatively speaking. However, we are a bureaucracy. And because we're a bureaucracy, we have a lot of problems around what I would call inertia and performance. We, we, we are, we're a bureaucracy, so you've got to deal with the bureaucracy. So there's a couple of things I would invite anybody who's listening now in positions of power within the United Nations to consider. All positions in the United Nations should be achieved on the basis of meritocracy. Meritocracy. There should be no political appointments. Secondly, the Security Council is controlled by five major states. In the modern world, where we have as many as 193 countries, we need to expand the number of permanent seats on the Security Council. These are some of the changes we need to make, 
as you can imagine, I could spend a lot more time talking mm. about the other suggestions that I might have for the United Nations. Mm. But a lot of it comes back to the fact that we have to be listening to people on the ground, especially young people. I have a lot of faith and confidence in young people, and I, will be, I believe they're one of the great ways that we can continue as a species to reinvent ourselves if we listen to young people. So when you mention listening to people, one of the challenges, I suppose, the UN faces is also of uh, coming with a sort of a um, one-size-fits-all kind of system, a universal system. And to some extent, all human beings share universal values and um, needs. So there are universal things as well. But at the same time, there are specific cultural contexts. The UN, based in New York and Geneva, couldn't impose all the values on a Middle Eastern Arabic state or a Chinese state. There are sort of local cultural contexts to adjust to. Has the UN been doing that effectively? Or are a lot of the challenges that the UN faces as a result of such sort of homogenized one size standard? I'm going to start off with, my, with, with what can sound like a philosophical response. Mm. We live in a world where many of the institutions have become bankrupt over the last 15 or 20 years. Most Western religions have become bankrupt. Many banks have become morally bankrupt. And obviously, politicians in many, many countries have become bankrupt. So it is not surprising that the Uni United Nations is under extreme pressure. And we have to get ahead of the pressure. And one of the ways we have to get ahead of the pressure is we have to find new ways to hear what is happening. Recognize that we make mistakes. And when we make mistakes, we have to be very willing to acknowledge we've made a mistake. So, for example, we made mistakes in places like Rwanda with the genocide. We acknowledged it. We made mistakes with, um, in Haiti um, with uh, uh, typhus, I think it was, uh, typhoid. So we've made mistakes also in um, peacekeeping when it comes to sexual exploitation and abuse. And the good news is, from my perspective, is we acknowledge those mistakes. Sometimes it took us too long to acknowledge the mistakes. So my piece of advice to anybody who's listening is, and those of us who are in, at UN House today and who are UN staff members, or who aspire to be UN staff members, always be open about the mistakes you make because everybody knows we're human beings. Uh, so that's part of how I would respond to your question, Karma. So UN has made mistakes based on these cultural um, sort of differences, let's say. Um, I want to pick something that's more practical, bringing it down from the philosophical level. <laughs> um, for instance, here we have a security gate, which a lot of people have complained about, at least to me. I don't know how much complaint reaches you. Now, something like this is necessitated by the political situation in a place like Afghanistan. But in Bhutan, do you really need something like that? There has also been some noise in the Bhutanese community today that there is a brain drain from the civil service and the private sector to the UN. The UN almost creating some kind of a a privileged working group. Um, should the UN be sensitive to such issues? Because this could, at some point, affect the local economy and the local sort of human resource. So with respect to uh, access to UN House, it is true that we have strict security measures. And the reason we have strict security measures is that we have found over the last 20 years in what are called okay duty stations, mm. they ended up being very vulnerable to suicide bombers. Mm. So in the world today, no UN house is entirely safe. And we have to uh, put in place practices that ensure mm. that we have good security for all staff. Mm. However, as you are aware, I believe in ensuring as much openness at UN house as is possible. Mm. And indeed, that's one of the reasons why Bhutan Dialogues 
has been able to benefit from your UN house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, if I can come back to that. Now you have been, as a, a person and as the current um, resident coordinator of the UN, been very welcoming. You've tried to open the, the gates of UN house here. But uh, you have talked about how relative, how we have to see things relatively. Do the UN staff in Bhutan need a security that the rest of the country doesn't necessarily have or need? Of course, all UN houses around the world will be having, facing some threats, but why should the UN house in Timpu face more threat than the parliament building or the, the, a school or a hospital here? Uh, you know, there, sometimes with a good question, there is no right or wrong answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, you, can, you can parse this question 150 directions. And I can spend 150 minutes explaining my angle, and your angle is perfectly legitimate, right? Mm. It has substance. Mm. Well, well, well and good. Thank you for the response. I think this is like a message that I would like to relay through this dialogue to the higher UN authorities <laughs> when they think about the budget and systems here. Um, but talking about the brain drain, okay. what is your take on the brain drain from the Bhutanese organizations to the UN House? The United Nations has to be mindful. You asked us, mm. should we be mindful? Absolutely. Mm. We have to be mindful of any brain drain that we support or empower unnecessarily. Mm. And we have to balance that with the fact that we're in a democracy where people have the freedom to apply for positions mm. at the United Nations. Mm. Now, you know, I'm able to actually see these type of questions from a longer term perspective. I'm able to be reminded that the number of the UN staff who have worked at UN House over the years have become ministers in government and who have become senior cabinet secretaries and secretaries in the government. So I see the capacity building as going back and forth. Interestingly, I also believe that some of these national staff who, become, who join um, from government, for example, or from the CSOs into the United Nations go on to taking international positions around the world. Mm. So in a sense, the United Nations becomes a window on mm. the international global environment for Bhutanese people. From my perspective, that's, that's, uh, that's wise development. But is that the priority of the UN, is what I'm asking. So, of course, uh, when you get an opportunity to work in an international organization, you will obviously be enhancing your capacity more than those who didn't have such an opportunity. But should the UN, as its sort of policy, as its pra practice, um, create UN offices in third world countries where the UN organization becomes a sort of a elite, well paid category of jobs, um, and everybody in the, the, the source country, the society, aspires to move from their local organization to UN? Shouldn't the UN adapt to the local context? and be on par with whatever country they are working with. So our priorities are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and the UN Charter and the Declaration of Human Rights, mm. period. And then how should international organizations adapt to the country mm. in which they're located? Mm. So I would say there's at least two or three things we should do. Mm. We should be having an incredibly, here in the case of Bhutan, we should be having an incredibly close relationship with the Prime Minister's Office, the Foreign Ministry, and Gross National Happiness. Mm. And in those discussions, we often talk about things mm. like along the lines of what we are now talking mm. about. Mm. And we need to have frank and transparent conversations. Mm. And I would also have to say that we have to invite ourselves to be coming to places like Bhutan Dialogues and responding to these type of questions mm. as best we mm. can. Mm. We don't get mm. it right all the mm. time, mm. but we are trying. Mm. You know, I personally have high regard for the UN. Now, I wouldn't bring UN down to the level of World Bank, for instance. The World Bank has its own agenda, but UN exists to serve the marginalized, disadvantaged, poor people of the world. So that's why I bring up this question of whether the UN officers should really be working for the people being on the same level rather than creating a a privileged group in the country. But I want to come down to Bhutan, where you have worked earlier as a WFP uh, representative, and now you have then led the UNDP and 
have become the resident coordinator for all UN. And there are 35 MRH UN organizations in the country. So in your experience, you have worked here before the elections, the democratic elections started, before we got our elected governments, you worked after. What do you see um, in terms of changes in Bhutan? Do you think Bhutan has done so well, has got a lot better, or you regret the changes that has happened in the last 15 years or so? Generally speaking, I'm not a person who regrets. Mm -hmm. This is the life we've been given. We make it work as best we can. Um, one of the changes that has happened that has surprised me mm. is that if I take the case between 2003 and 2007 and the last five years, we seem to find it easier today to spend money than we did 16, 17, 18 years ago. Mm. And this, uh, this consumerism, we, we, we're not necessarily doing ourselves any favours. Um, and now, as many people predict, we could be in an economic tight period. Mm. So the more we find ways to be economical in the way we spend money, makes a lot of sense to me. Um, perhaps we're going to get the chance to talk about this. I come from a family where my father died when I was 10. And we went through a tough period as a family. Um, and... Um, um, we, it was tough. I mean, we got through it, right? Mm. But as a result, I don't believe in spending money I don't have in my pocket. I actually don't believe in credit debt. Mm. If I don't have it, I don't spend it. And I don't think that's... I, I believe that's a good ethic to follow. I think it's a good ethic to follow at a personal level, mm. but it's also a good ethic to follow as a country. country. Spend the money that you have. Mm. Don't spend the money that comes in as loans. Mm. Because even interest-free loans imply some level of commitment to somebody outside the country. So reduce your loans as much as possible unless there is a common sense reason to invest in it. Mm. Now, common sense, we could spend a little bit of time. When is it wise to take out loans? Uh, I believe investing in young people is a good investment. Mm. So human capital formation makes a lot of sense to me. Mm. Taking out loans for human capital formation is wise in my mind. Mm. So some social investments is what we should have. But uh, of course the country has been, um, uh, has its uh, debts growing in the past uh, decades. Um, besides the debt problem that Bhutan faces and has been facing for some time now, what other things you would have liked to see changed or improved here in Bhutan for the next RC to effectively work with Bhutan for the benefit of the youth in particular? If we were, if we were trying to project forward for the next two years, there's a number of things that I would, um, I would advocate for, I would suggest. Uh, number one, um, I, would, I think we can hope for good times but we have to be ready for tough times. And that's not just true of Bhutan. I think it's true of the world. I'm reminded that uh, about three or four months ago, Lynchen indicated that we have to be ready for pandemics in the future. I very much agree with uh, Lynchen in this regard. So there's a couple of things I would do. I would greatly strengthen DDM. Disaster, uh, the Department of Disaster Management. The Department of Disaster Management within the Ministry of Home Affairs. This, for me, is a, is a department that uh, it, there is no downside to having a strong DDM. Secondly, when it comes to climate action, we need to be taking on uh, a, a, a stronger uh, impetus around strengthening how we do climate, how we access climate finance. For example, I would strengthen the work of Bhutan Trust Fund for Environmental Conservation. Mm. Number three... Uh, we have a, um, a, a, a social economic stabilization fund. Uh, some people call it the reserve, I, I understand. I would find ways to uh, put money into that uh, reserve so that we can handle rainy days in the future. Uh, number four, uh, I would find ways...
to strengthen the CSOs. I, 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 have a, I have a lot of belief that the CSOs in this country do a good job, and I would, uh, I would support them, but I wouldn't create any type of Kidu culture around the CSOs. Um, I, I'm not trying to make you feel good today, or, or anybody from Loden for that matter, but I find the way you do resource mobilization to be very good. You're not depending on the government for ha free handouts. Uh, you go out there and you, you, you hustle for resource mobilization. So these are some of the things that uh, the more the United Nations supports going forward, the better. A couple of other things. Um, climate change is going to go through many different <coughs> incarnations. We need Bhutanese people to be as smart as anybody in the world in the area of climate change. I believe the Royal University of Bhutan is trying slowly, slowly mm. to create a climate studies program. Mm. We need to find ways as the international community, but also as the Royal Government of Bhutan, mm. to support this initiative so that Bhutanese minds, the best Bhutanese minds, are going into and supporting climate change mm. and the changes that will be upon us. Mm. So um, you have mentioned many things that the government could do, the people here could do, and then the UN could engage in. Um, let's pick the civil society organizations systems here. You have worked uh, with the CSOs a lot. I have also been involved in it for almost two decades now. Um, if you were to measure the government's or the state's support and uh, recognition of the civil society culture, not just the existing organizations, but the overall civil society culture, which as a historian and culture scholar, I believe we had very strong in the past, but my, might have it seems to have declined after we got more urbanized and started to live uh, more individualistic lives. So if you were to assess the state support or state sort of uh, not necessarily monetary support, but general moral support. So from zero to 10, your style, where would you rank it? So um, it is true that I often ask questions of people on a scale of zero to 10, what do you think of this or what do you think of that? Mm. There are certain times, I never told anybody this, but let me share it today. There are times where you should never answer the question that is posed <laughs> like that. So today, I would not answer the question on a, in terms of zero to ten. Very what, diplomatic. <laughs> what I would say is this. My memory is about two months ago, there was a very important meeting between the Royal Government mm. of Bhutan and uh, civil society. And my memory is not only was the Prime Minister present, but there was three ministers present. Mm. So there is significant goodwill towards the CSOs, very significant. However, we have to recognize these are difficult times for any government anywhere in the world. So what we can ask of the Royal Government of Bhutan today if, in terms of supporting the CSOs is different than say four or five years ago when many of us thought we were, we, we were, we were so filled with uh, uh, golden goose eggs from mm. hydroelectricity, mm. right? So mm. times are changing, yeah. we have to be dynamic. Mm. My own view is the more we do capacity building around what I call innovative resource mobilization for CSOs, mm. the better. For example, the diaspora, um, I think it is on the 19th of March, sorry, on the 19th of January, the CSOs, the United Nations, the law school, um, are doing a res, uh, an innovative resource mobilization workshop for executive directors of CSOs. And in that training, we will be ad advocating for what I would call 21st century resource mobilization for CSOs. I would also say that CSOs, wherever it makes sense, should be considered for certain aspects of government implementation, okay? And the reason I say this is that certain aspects of government implementation can be essentially outsourced to the CSOs. That type of what I would call 
innovative programming makes sense. And the third thing I would say is that we know that there are some CSOs who are pushing themselves into this innovative space. Loden Foundation is one of them. This social enterprise work you do. The fact that you are doing very active resource mobilization in places like Japan. All of the CSOs can do something like that. Last point. There probably needs to be some consideration given by the CSOs on what I would call mergers and acquisitions. For example, um, it, we have probably, I can't remember exactly, four or five CSOs working in the, in the area of mm, disability. disability. Mm. So we should at least ask the question, can there be some amalgamation in this space? So then the CSOs themselves are showing what I would call an entrepreneurial spirit. Mm. Of course, as you said, um, the current government has a lot of goodwill, and we hope that goodwill will also translate into changes in the regulations and the procedures that the CSOs have to go through. Um, the other point you brought up is regarding disaster. Um, we have other players uh, right now working on emergency. So uh, how would you see the role of DESUP, for instance, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Department of Disaster Management? The way I see things is that the way we do development work and the way we prepare for a disaster has to be dramatically different. Mm. So the first thing is we're talking about a different dimension of work. So many of us here in Bhutan have only worked in development and we're not able to truly make the shift that, oh yeah, preparing for a disaster is a different dimension of work. So the first thing we all have to do is say to ourselves, this is something different. So that's number one. Number two, some people would openly acknowledge that how different parts of government, CSOs, the society, we sometimes don't talk to each other very well. And because we don't talk to each other very well, we don't always achieve the highest levels of results. When it comes to disaster preparedness and response, when we don't talk to each other, that could cost lives. So it's a different conversation. So the first thing that needs to happen is there has to be what I would call seamless communication going on between the various parts of what is a disaster preparedness and response mechanisms here in Bhutan. So we're not just talking about between the DESUPS and DDM. We're talking about DESUPS, DDM, police, army, United Nations, all of the ministries of this country, mm -hmm. and it has to be as close to seamless as mm -hmm. is imaginable. Obviously, all led by um, Lynchin, um, the National Disaster Response Mechanisms of the country, mm -hmm. and uh, ably guided by His Majesty. When it comes to response, I personally think that there is one very, very crucial player that perhaps uh, you, you didn't include in the list you gave, which actually makes all the difference. In fact, the reason why when there is a local disaster, such as a fire blazing below Wang Dize here, why that fire even reaches the temple is because people are waiting for the death soups of the police or the army to come and um, blow it off, or to, uh, what's the word, to uh, stop the fire. But if you go back to the traditional villages, there you have that civil society culture where the community owns the environment, the community owns the, the properties, and so there is much faster, more efficient, organized response. Now, at the moment, we don't see that role. In fact, that role of taking local ownership has been declining in the past few decades. So how can we bring this civil society culture in the grassroots and then have them work with the more organized state-level mechanisms? Okay, so earlier on in this conversation today, you asked me about the changes between uh, Bhutan 16, 17 years ago and today. And I answered it one dimension. Another dimension that we could have talked about is the urbanization of Bhutan. It's happening incredibly fast. And because it's happening so fast, the community dimensions that you just spoke about 
can work for some of our rural villages, continue to work. But if we're talking about urban Bhutan, okay, and if we are, for example, imagining a scenario for an earthquake here in Timpu Valley, we have to be mindful that these, this, is the 20, this is 2022. So I would not necessarily rely on community spirit to respond to an earthquake if it happened tomorrow. I would invite ourselves to be ready with the desups, with the police, with the firemen, with the Royal Bhutan Army, you know. So all of those structures really need to be working together. And where it works, then obviously the Red Cross would have a very good mm. fingers into the community as well. When you look back your time here in Bhutan, do you have some special moments that you really, that comes to your mind and you would take back home with you? Um, were there also times when you really um, faced difficulties that, that we should be warned of, that you should share with us so we can avoid such problems? Well, as, as I mentioned earlier on, I don't, I have, I, I rarely focus on regrets. Mm. Um, on the whole, your Bhutan experience. So my um, Bhutan experience. If, <laughs> if I were to again use the scale of zero to ten, <laughs> ten being the optimal sort of fulfillment and uh, joy you would derive from a posting. Well, um, um, the reason I don't like answering <laughs> this question is because um, you? Um, I, I, Irish people, mm. when we have it good, we don't like talking about it. Mm. And, and that's very it's also true with the traditional Bhutanese. Yeah, yeah, we don't. We, we're afraid our luck might run out the window on us, <laughs> and I wouldn't want the luck to run out. Mm. But what I can say is this, uh, the pilgrimages to Ajane mm. and Singizong were, um, were um, what's this word? They helped, they helped s cement, I don't like that word cement, they, they, they fortified me mm. in ways that were truly exceptional. Mm. I probably already was relatively open to pilgrimages uh, in my own mindset, but something quite effective, affecting, helped me during these, uh, these uh, pilgrimages. And um, I'm very lucky, they, they planted seeds uh, that I know will continue to grow. And I don't just mean this from a spiritual dimension. I would say that they, uh, they planted seeds of uh, sustenance so that whatever, comes, whatever happens in our lives, in my life, I would say there will be a residue from this experience, a residue in my consciousness. Um, I, I know you enough to sort of appreciate that you, you like such sacred, uh, quiet, uh, pristine places. Um, to use another of your um, sort of question tactics, if you had to win a million dollar lottery tomorrow, what are the few things that you would spend that on? So if, uh, if I was lucky enough to win a uh, um, uh, million dollars, mm. uh, the first thing I would do, I would try and leverage it. Mm. So I would invite the head of DHI, um, um, the head of Tashi Group, um, the head of Singhi Group, and I would invite them for all a, a cup of tea. And uh, I, would, uh, I would say, is there any way you could join this million dollars with another million from each of you? Mm. And um, I would then advocate for about two or three CSOs to receive funding. For example, uh, uh, I, I believe gender-based violence is a concern here in Bhutan. So I would find a way to advocate for the work of Renew. I think Renew does great work. Mm. I, 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 you know, um, we, we are, uh, some of the stuff, some of the stories that come from Olaka are tough mm. stories. Mm. Some of the stories that come from um, various parts of, of Bhutan um, 
the cases that we've seen in the newspapers over the last six or seven months, um, I, I, I think we, we need to be ready to find new ways to help renew. I also believe uh, in the next 10 years we have 115,000 young people joining the workforce. So we're going to have to find new ways to create jobs, upskilling. Um, and there are some great CSOs working in this space. Um, I believe in the area of mental health. Uh, uh, we are dealing with, as, as uh, Her Majesty uh, re recently mentioned, we're dealing with some very high rates of suicide. Mm. So these are some of the challenges that I would advocate with um, our colleagues from DHI, mm. uh, uh, the colleagues from uh, Tashi Group, um, Singhi Group, and I believe we would, we would find a way to leverage mm. the million dollars and, and bring benefit to the vulnerable in this country. That's my answer. Wonderful. Well, may you win the million dollar lottery. Um, so you're not saving anything for your retirement. So that's the problem. So I want to ask you, how are you going to, no, where are you going to live? How are you going to live? What are you going to do after retirement? So earlier on, I mentioned uh, Singhi Zong. So one of the seeds that got planted in my mind is that I will pilgrimage between Ralung to Kailash. Mm -hmm. And I will probably do that sometime in the next three years. Sometime in the next three years. And I will do that because, uh, and I hope Celine, my wife, joins me, uh, at least for some of it. Uh, I will do that because um, uh, there is something uh, deep in my unconscious mm -hmm. with respect to Tibet which uh, Bhutan has triggered. And I, I look forward to um, um, spending times, spending some time in some of the great meditation caves of Tibet. Uh, also, sometime over the coming years, I, sooner rather than later, I hope to start working with an Irish NGO that works in the South Sudan. And uh, I will do that because, uh, uh, as a volunteer, because uh, South Sudan is one of the countries in the world that is in desperate need of, uh, let's call it, applied compassion. Mm. Um, uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about the challenges of South Sudan, but uh, we, we also need to be thinking of putting ourselves out on a limb and helping those people who are living mm. in some of the most toughest conditions known to be for humans in our modern world. Any question online? So Ugin is going to read out the questions from our audience. Three. The first question. What are some of the human rights issues that you think are happening in Bhutan or you foresee in the future? Should there be any such issues, even if the government is a violator, Will the UN and Bhutan deal with it according to your mandates, or would you take a step back? And I'll come back in a second. Uh, how can the youth be involved in socially developing sustainability for a better UN? And how do you think the UN can help in rebuilding a sustainable Bhutan in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic? So let me start with the easier parts of this question, and I'll work back towards the harder parts. So in terms of sustainability, um, we have to be advocating for as many areas of self-reliance as we possibly can. Um, many of you who are at UN House today, but also those who have visited UN House, will know that as of today, we have around 45% of our electricity coming from solar panels. And uh, Choni uh, uh, leads this work. We have around 30% of our cars, electric cars. Mm. Now, if the UN can do that, we can be a role model for the rest of society. Mm. Uh, there are some other things we're doing. Uh, for example, uh, UN House is relatively uh, um, set up, relatively well set up, to help those who are uh, handicapped or disabled in some way. That can be applied 
for other buildings, mm. perhaps someday all buildings of Bhutan. So that's part of sustainability. I think another aspect of sustainability is uh, how do we uh, be a role model for capacity building. I, I now realize that the United Nations, we haven't always helped in the way we did capacity building. We often created an environment of what I would call a workshop tourism to places like Bangkok. Somebody would leave Bhutan for four or five days, go to a workshop in Bangkok, come back and not really share anything that they have learned. And we're attracted not necessarily to increase their knowledge of the world, but rather to increase the DSA or the per diem that they had received. So these are cultural things that the UN created, and we have to move beyond that type of training. We have to be more efficient in the way we provide training, and we have to be a role model for what I would call economical training. Another type of sustainability that I could speak to is the importance of uh, gender equality. I always knew it was important for decision makers to be equally represented male and female. But I would have to say it's only in the last five years that the UN is walking the talk in this area. And there is no doubt in my mind that the United Nations is becoming a smarter organization because we have more senior leaders who are female. That's part of sustainability. Makes a lot of sense to me. And last idea around sustainability is working with the media, working with the Royal University of Bhutan, thinking about how we understand development. My definition of development is, it is better to teach somebody how to fish than to give them a fish. It's better to teach somebody how to fish than to give it to them. So that needs to be driving all of the conversations we do when it comes to capacity building including how we access climate finance over the coming years. And that's why earlier in today's conversation, I spoke about the importance of further strengthening the Bhutan Trust Fund for Environmental Conservation. We need to bring new levels of innovation into everything we do. We need to be stealing ideas from all around the world and bringing them and applying them here in Bhutan. By the way, we do some things here in Bhutan that are real cutting edge. For life. Bhutan for life. That's cutting edge, mm. innovative climate finance. And we need to be, we as the United Nations need to be bringing that principle, which WWF does in concert with UNDP, and we need to be bringing it to other countries. So those are some of my answers around sustainability. By the way, two small points, not small points, but some important points. We have to be bringing the youth into these conversations again mm. and again and again. It's all about the youth. I'm not trying to say us people with white hair are, we're not relevant, mm. but it's the young people who are extra relevant and we have to find change makers mm. within the space of young people and give them the opportunity to make few mistakes and in that way we can continue to be innovative and getting ahead of the changes and getting ahead of the challenges that are upon us, whether we like it or not, we will be dealing with a century of challenge. Mm. Innovations at a speed of light that we have not known hardly ever. Dramatic changes are ahead for all of us. Mm. Human rights. Thank you for this question. That's what you should always say, by the way, when you get a good question. And you need more time to think about, well, how do I want to answer this question? So, there's a number of things that the Royal Government of Bhutan is committed to, and the United Nations is so grateful for the work and commitment on what is called the UPR process, Universal Periodic Review. That's coming up over the next year or so. I think the Royal Government of Bhutan's commitment to the UPR is, is extremely strong. I would also say that CRC process, Convention on the Rights of the Child, very committed uh, Royal Government of Bhutan, and um, 
Dashaw Rinchen, the former head of NCWC, is even a board member on the CRC convention. So we can see levels of commitment on human rights that are very effective. We can do more. Uh, I think it's about 11 years ago we signed the Convention on Disability. Let us ratify it. Let us ratify it sooner rather than later. That for me makes a lot of sense. I also believe that um, when it comes to um, human rights, we need to be asking ourselves, how, what does it mean for us to sign something with the United Nations and not walk the talk here in Bhutan? So gender-based violence is a human rights issue, right? Mm. Um, uh, sexual exploitation and abuse, it's a human rights issue. How do we walk the talk on compassion? So I would almost shift the conversation from human rights or dignity, and I would shift it into the category of active compassion. When we talk about gross national happiness, we're talking about compassion for our fellow human beings. How can we allow our brothers, often it's men who are um, perpetrators of violence, how can we allow our brothers and our fathers to do things to our sisters and our mothers and our aunts that are clearly acts of violence. How can we condone it? So, from my perspective, compassion or human rights, it's not just about conventions, it's not just about laws, it's how we act towards each other day in, day out. My question is, uh, what's your opinion about the increasing number of Bhutanese leaving the country to work? And what do you think uh, can be the future implications uh, of this to Bhutan? Although it brings, although it currently brings uh, foreign remittance back to the country. I live in a world where I'm constantly wanting to look at, uh, with my eyes wide open. I recognize that some people are concerned at the number of people, young people, who are leaving Bhutan. My own perspective is, we, we need to do a few things. First of all, let's work as hard as we possibly can to create job and work opportunities here in Bhutan. However, I also believe if there are no jobs that we can find for these incredibly educated young people, we may wish to allow and support their movement to places like Australia. But even as we support their shifts, their migration to other countries outside of Bhutan, I would also say we should try and find ways to do a few things. Number one, maintain the links between the diaspora and the Bhutanese society. Maintain the links. And, and some of you may be aware of this, use the diaspora and invite them after two or three or four or five years to come back to Bhutan so as to create small industries. A number of countries, including India and Ireland, do this magnificently. So there's a lot of good practices out there. And I would be providing, I would be willingly providing great tax breaks so as to attract the diaspora back to Bhutan. Mm. And then not only do they bring back jobs, create jobs for young people in Bhutan, but they also ensure that their own kids come back to the culture of Bhutan to spend time with their grandparents and their uncles and their aunts and get a Bhutanese education, which from my perspective is of the highest quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another dimension to that is, you know, we always see the um, grass green on the other side. So often it helps for a Bhutanese to go abroad once, to appreciate Bhutan fully, and of course gain the experience and whatever they can in that period, and come back to build Bhutan more effectively. So I think this kind of experience definitely helps. But then if you have majority of the young people going out, we may have serious uh, uh, human resource problems at home, that there may not be a good Bhutan to, for these people to return to in the future. So, we're, we're sitting here and we have the ability 
to, to, in a sense, sit on the fence, mm. right? And we have these 115,000 people over the next 10 years that will be entering the labor force. So we have to have, we're, we're imagining how do we game out scenarios for 115,000 people. So there won't, be one, there won't be one solution for all of the 115,000. So we need to be cooking up multiple solutions. Here's a solution. Now that uh, Karma has invited me to be extra innovative. <laughs> I believe foreign direct investment wisely applied can be a bigger boost to the creation of jobs in this society. I believe that sometimes you need an extra empowered person. In the West, they're often called czars within the civil service. So you could call, you could create a position for, so as to attract additional foreign direct investment, mm. and you could call the position FDI czar. That person could work across three or four or five ministries. And that person's, you could experiment with this idea for two years. You need to attract into this position somebody who has incredibly good um, management skills. You would, that person would need to have the very highest levels of trust within the government and across the society, all parts of the society. And if somebody is interested, I, I believe there are some great people who can easily fill this position and would have the trust of everybody so as to attract higher levels of foreign direct investment. Mm. Karma, I know this was a tough question. The reason I'm particularly interested in foreign direct investment is many of you were aware earlier this week in the Council we saw that our current foreign direct investment allurements are very low. They were very low for no. 2021. Mm. So we have to work harder on foreign direct investment. That's why I'm drawing a connection between increasing the amount of money coming in on foreign direct investment and jobs for these 115,000 young people that are entering the workforce over the next 10 years. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic um, approach to solve this issue. But this czar will have to work with multiple ministries and will have to take up the challenge of undoing so many red tape that exist in environment, in culture, in immigration, and many other areas. I think at the moment, Bhutan is not a desired destination for foreign direct investors. There are many other countries that are far more welcoming. Um, any other question? The theme today is the changes we need for a UN we want. Uh, I'd like to twist it a little, and uh, I'd like to throw the question, uh, share one thing uh, that you would expect for uh, the change we need for a UN to be do, able to do more in Bhutan. Like one thing, from your experience. Sangha, um, let me first of all congratulate you on taking on the president position at Loden Foundation. Great CSO, look forward to working with you. One thing, one thing that's not going to cost a lot of money, but have an incredibly great impact. We have to strengthen the National Statistics Bureau. Jimmy Sering knows his job. Our statistics, uh, the Royal Government of Bhutan in what is called the VNR process, Voluntary National Review a year ago and two years ago acknowledged that statistics is not working nearly to the level of quality we mm. need it to be working. If we don't have good statistics, it's like trying to drive a car over Dochula in the middle of the night without lights. Right? Good statistics are not um, a luxury. So I would mm. say let us all, but the Royal Government of Bhutan, the development partners, and anybody who's interested in supporting mm. Bhutan, let us <coughs> strengthen greatly the work of the National Statistics Bureau. And the sooner we do it, the mm. better. And in fact, uh, we need a much better research and development culture as a whole across the society. I think um, um, NSP can do for the state what they need to do, but we need perhaps uh, such research uh, uh, thinking in many other sectors. Um, if there are no other questions, we'll wrap it up. It's almost an hour. 
Um, and as usual, I would like to ask you, um, we have been talking quite a lot about role models here in Bhutan Dialogues. Do you believe in role models? Do you have one? And do you want to share who that role model is? So my role models are uh, a f uh, one of the Secretary Generals of the United Nations who was assassinated, Dag Hammarskjöld. Um, he brought incredible he, he brought incredible levels of innovation into the United Nations civil service. And the second role model was before we had the United Nations, we had what was called the League of Nations. And the last Secretary General of the League of Nations was an Irishman. His name was Sean Lester. And before becoming the Secretary General of the League of Nations, he, uh, he spent a lot of time uh, advocating for refugees uh, uh, and pushing back on the Nazis. So Sean Lester and Dag Hammarskjöld are my role models. But I would have to say that uh, um, my family, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Sangay, I think you, you spoke about this in your opening, my wife inspires me, my kids inspire me, my brothers inspire me, and um, their families. And interestingly enough, and I don't understand how this is happening, about five or six years ago, I started to say to myself, could it be possible that everybody I meet is my teacher? Could that be possible? And the more I, you know the concept of fake it till you make it? Mm. So I have applied fake it till you make it to this idea of everybody is my teacher. And that also has power. So in that sense, yes. everybody is my inspiration. Mm. Most especially yourself, Dr. Carmen. Thank you. Well, I suppose we should, you should extend that further and probably try to fake it until you make it. But with everything, everything can be a teacher. Um, but finally, what helps you keep on top of things? Do you have exercises that you do or meditation, walks? This is a, a kind of a habit or practice that you do which others can emulate if it's applicable. So I constantly am looking for wells of inspiration. And about a year and a half ago, I realized that death could become a teacher. And I still haven't entirely unlocked death as a teacher, but I suspect sometime in the next 10 or 15 years, mm -hmm. I will build a sufficient relationship with death mm -hmm. that I will no longer fear it. Fear mm -hmm. her or fear him. Or it. Or it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but th that's a very, very Buddhist uh, statement you're making. Uh, in many ways, um, our life is a preparation for our death, and the quality of our death will define who we are throughout our life. Um, thank you. Um, I bring the sessions to close with the Bhutanese saying, and today I thought I should choose this. A good friend's character is like gold. Good gold does not change its hue. So, Jerry, you have been a very good friend, um, not only for Bhutan or for the Bhutan Dialogues, but to me in particular. And we hope you have one more month to be in Bhutan, but even beyond that, after that, that you will remain a true friend of Bhutan and also committed to Bhutan Dialogues. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Kadanchela, Kadanchela.